Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm from wikibon.org, and we're here at the IOD conference, IBM's big event. It's historically an information management conference, but it's evolved and really morphed into an analytics and, and big data conference, which is, from my perspective, more exciting than information management, but a lot of those information management technologies, things like classification and search, are, are you know, used and utilized and extensively in IBM's new offerings. So we're seeing the industry's broadest part portfolio in big data. There's no question about that. Um, and IBM really forcing us to think big at this event. That's the, the mantra, the tagline of the event is think big, a play off of Thomas Wasson's think, the most famous line, the most famous mantra or tagline in IT industry history. Uh, very good show, probably about uh, 12 to 13,000 attendees here, a lot of practitioners, a lot of business getting done. And um, good show by IBM, uh, very impressive. And uh, we're here, this is theCUBE. Uh, this is where we bring you all the best guests that we can find. We extract the signal from the noise. And I'm here with my co-host. I'm Jeff Kelly, also from Wikibon, uh, covering all things big data. And uh, we're here with our next guest, uh, another great guest, Michelle Mott. Welcome, uh, Vice Thank President you. of Business Analytics and IBM Software Group. Great to be here. Welcome to theCUBE. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming I, you on. You know, being a business anal analytics person, I'm very comfortable with a cube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and right. And, and yeah. Indeed. Of, of course, I think you guys invented the We did, the, the power cube. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at things in multiple, multiple dimensions. dimensions and yeah. So I have to ask you, so um, business analytics, yep. big data, are they one and the same? Are they different? What is that? They're, they're the yin and the yang. I mean, really, big data is a foundation for business analytics today. That a lot of the new advances that organizations are making in terms of their business outcomes are being driven from a combination of big data with advanced analytics. And, and you can't have one without the other, really, to truly drive business outcomes. So it's, for us, it's about getting at new data sources into the analytic environment, like the social media, and getting things in at more volume to be able to process them in real time so that people in the operational areas can actually take advantage of them. So what do you mean by real time? How do you yeah. define that? So real time is in the moment when people are trying to make decisions, but they can't make decisions in, in the way that you would make a decision. So you would make a decision by taking the time to analyze whatever information as a knowledge worker that you have available to you. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who work in real time environments where they are being pressed to make a decision right now they don't have the luxury of doing analysis the way knowledge workers do analysis. They have to be essentially given answers, not insight. <laughs> and so that's really what we mean by real time, is delivering to people the right next action <laughs> in, in the moment. Okay, you're, you're the cop, you're on, you're on the beat, and the crimes are happening, the predictive models are working in real time, they're seeing patterns in crime, they're directing you, to go to that precinct because crime is popping up and they're putting more police officers right in the moment versus three days later analyze and say, yeah, there's a lot of crime uh, <laughs> that happened in the air. So that's what we mean by real time. Talk about what's changed. I mean, where, how did we get here? So, you know, the world of decision support <laughs> and, and data warehousing <laughs> and, you know, the promise of, of, of 360 degree views and predictive right. analytics and, and it was always a struggle. You know, it was like this patchwork of, of infrastructure yeah. and applications and all of a sudden, you know, the light, you know, shines and big data comes into the, to the yeah. fore and these two worlds are mashing up. Can you talk about that a little bit from your perspectives yeah. as to what's changed? What's changed is the technology can, can handle it now. I mean, that's fundamentally what's changed. Big data's not new. <laughs> Telcos have been collecting yeah. call data record, detailed records forever. And yeah, there's more now than ever before. So what? There's still bigger data. Bigger yeah. data, yeah. right? But you know, when you're getting to, to petabytes to zettabytes, and you know, it's all big, yeah. right? So I think what's changed is now the ability to make sense of it, to do something with it, versus just taking all that big data and archiving it, which is what people were doing, because they couldn't make sense of it. There was just too much there. Now they can they can actually make sense the old signal through the noise, 
um, uh, analogy, I think, is exactly what's happening. Right? I'm sometimes hard on the sort of traditional data warehousing BI business, even though it's you know created tremendous value and. Uh, you know, I remember the days of, you know, the original days of the beer next to the diaper, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. the, the Walmart example. And, but at the same time, it, it, I always, have, I said, been hard on it because I feel like it failed to live up to the original promises. What do you think is different this time around? Well, first I don't, I don't believe it didn't live up to the original promises, so let me address that first, because I think, I think there was, um, there was a, a massive, uh, lack of understanding of how to drive classic BI. So people built it, they built it from the ground up. I have this much information, I'm going to build reports that, after, that reflect that information, then I'm going to present it to my users. Versus starting with the business problem, thinking about what information can help me think differently about my business, and what information would really impact my business, and then building the BI down. Um, and predictive, because to me, BI is a spectrum that's more than reporting, right? It covers predictive and, and a analysis, classic reporting and query. And now I think we're, what big data does to it is it also now, t um, it's brought the conversation to the boardroom, it's brought the conversation to the line of business, and it's making people think that way. And that is a huge change. Mm -hmm. Because before, to get a, a marketing person to engage in a conversation about data, was virtually impossible. It was People's too hard eyes, though, right, right? But now you've got Harvard Business Review writing about big data. You've got all the big pubs writing about big data. You've got you guys talking about big data. We again. started it. Right, so, <laughs> so I think you know, that, that, that is putting people into a mind that, set that says data is my, should be my companion in my journey and analytics is the way to make sense of that data. So there are two peas in a pod, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so fair enough. And of course, from a reporting standpoint, huge success, right? It got yeah. us out of the, 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 the Enron disaster, and then, but the predictive analytics side yeah. is getting a new face now, isn't it? And sure, because the more, the more data that you can bring into a predictive model, the more accurate that prediction becomes. Jeff Jonas' puzzle pieces, right? Exactly, yeah. right? So, so you bring more data, the more types of data, so it's not just more data, because that, that was probably not the best way to say it, it's more and different types then you become much more informed. The cu customer example is the best, right? Because just understanding transactional records, if there's volumes, okay, it tells you a little bit. Add on all their comments, add on the social sentiment, add on you know, all the other things that are going on in the blog sphere. All of a sudden, now you have a much more complete view of that customer, and that's really changing the business. What are some of the more exciting things that your customers are doing with, with the data and with the analytics? Yeah. The, I think the most exciting examples are the center stone example that we saw this morning in the, in the main stage where they're using it to improve um, mental health mm -hmm. because they're using predictive to be able to optimize their operational um, environment, predicting when um, patient loads would be greater, uh, optimizing every single part of their business through analytics and being able to accept more patients. So they're, they're actually fundamentally making an, a societal improvement. So I always like the ones where Analytics is helping people to do better for people. Mm. But, and then we have fraud reduction. It, it's one of my favorite examples because people see, see the results instantly. <laughs> Instantly, you know, when you can reduce fraud in your business, um, you, you see money piling up and then it, it, it gets people in the line of business supporting it and then they start thinking, well, if they've saved $200 million, like Santam debt did, um, well, maybe I could too in this area, or maybe I could use it to drive new revenue opportunity. It gets people thinking analytically. So fraud's a, a, an exciting hot so area. So let's talk about fraud. So what's the, what's the breakthrough there? Is it that I don't have to sample anymore? I can actually work in a whole, the entire data set? Absolutely, or? that's yeah. exactly it. Because yeah. sampling all, I mean sampling was good, but sampling was a sample, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. And and oh, I missed that one. <laughs> right. I missed. The, yeah, I missed that one. That was happened to be the, the big <laughs> one. <laughs> right. It's right. the anomalies that you want to find. Maybe we'll get it well, next time. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that being able to parse all the data is is that's the technology technology advancement that has taken us from where we've always been with fraud, which was the sampling world, to now the there's no sample in real time. Records are being processed for for fraud. Mm. All uh, you know. 
everywhere, uh, many different industries are using it. Mm -hmm. right? So how do you approach the, I guess, the behavioral challenge of changing the behavior of your customers who, who maybe you know, have built up their own processes over the years, a lot of times using IBM technology, yeah. uh, to start thinking analytically, as you, as you put it. Um, yeah. The idea of getting a recommendation saying this is the next step you could take, you know, rub some people the wrong way, like a machine telling me what I should do next. It's, some people you know, push, push against that. So how do you go about, not just from a technology perspective, but from a cultural, behavioral perspective, get people to start understanding the power of predictive analytics and how it can help your business and it's not, it's not something to you'd be afraid of? Well, we've, we spend more time talking to line of business than we do IT today and I'm in the marketing side of the world, so this is a fundamental shift from five years ago mm -hmm. where we would have spent we, probably 30% of our time talking the line of business uh, and the rest to IT or lob it, mm -hmm. I like to say. <laughs> but now we're talking the line of business and when we talk to them, we talk to them about what their peers are doing in their industry yeah. and then you don't have to <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ask for their attention, they are all over it because everybody is suffering competitively, everybody, right? Everybody's being asked to do more with less. Everybody's at the breaking point and they need innovation. They can't, they can't cut more and do more. <laughs> and right. so they're desperate in a lot of environments to, to find the secret sauce, if you will, to help them innovate to grow again. And, they, and then when we show them that analytics is doing it for other companies, you know, then, then all of a sudden, and we have this, I, I don't, you've probably seen the, C, the um, MIT Sloan study that showed the difference between the analytic haves and have nots, we use that really effectively mm -hmm. as a door opener to get people to say, look, where are you in this spectrum? Because the chasm's getting wider, which side do you want to be on? So give mm -hmm. us an example, pick any industry you want, and talk mm -hmm. about the conversations that you're having with the line of business um, mm -hmm. you know, versus the, you know, the, the spinning disc conversation with IT. Right. Well, so there's, we have conversations mostly around four areas. Customer analytics, and that varies from, from uh, industry to industry. So, mm -hmm. customer analytics and banking, it's some call center conversations, mm -hmm. it's about marketing outreach, so optimizing your campaign so that you're not sending you and you and me the same proposal when we really have nothing in common mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of our financial world necessarily, right? Um, so, so segmentation, targeted marketing uh, from a customer analytics perspective there. Telco, so much of Telco right now is call center, mm -hmm. you know, that, that um, proactive approach to people to say, now you should be doing this because you understand this customer so well, so treating the customer as an individual. Um, and then we take it to insurance, it's, it's really more in the fraud area that we talk mm -hmm. uh, to insurance right now because they spend so much time putting investigators on uh, claims that they really shouldn't be investigating. And conversely, they miss ones they should. Right, so being able to target which claims should be fast-tracked and getting those through right away and paying people right away, their customer sat goes through the roof. And then being able to reduce the amount of fraudulent claims that go through the system also saves them money. So it's a double benefit for them. Prove customer satisfaction, decrease fraud. Huge business impact. Huge yeah. business impact. The other, there's two other areas though that we're really big into right now. One is uh, finance. And we talk to finance about basically becoming not just the, the, the financial uh, watchdog, if you will, but actually becoming what we call a strategic co-pilot for performance. So today, finance is mired down in reports. They have to generate all this information for everybody instead of thinking about how do I help this organization drive the business. And now, by helping them to automate some of the processes that, that they spend a lot of time on in spreadsheets today, they can, mm -hmm. Save that time, start thinking more about the, the business strategically, looking at predictive analytics, do things like predictive forecasting, so now they can say, based on where our metrics are today, guys, in a year from now, we'll be here. <laughs> it's probably not a good place, or this is a great place, whatever the case may be, but that helps them to be partners in the business versus just the guys always you know, laying out the finances. And, mm -hmm. and then the other is risk. And risk analytics is, is not just for banking and insurance anymore. Um, there's a lot of conversation on the IT risk side. People uh, preventing um, a loss of identifiable personal information. Mm -hmm. A Huge. big one. Yep. Um, so, so risk has become a more generic conversation, or not generic, but more generalized conversation by industry as well. So those are the four things we talk to line of business about. Can you talk about the data sources and how that's changing? Yeah. Well, the data source, we have a lot more people looking at unstructured content than ever before, and that's, that's a given. In terms of social, 
most of our customers want to do something with social. Very few are actually actively engaged in real meaningful business outcomes, business outcome driven social projects. So, so we're at the early stage in, in that area in terms of really driving substantial outcomes, but everybody wants to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because everybody's, you know, they're out there, you talk about here about sentiment, and everybody's yeah. listening, and it's like, okay, you know, green. But, but so what? It's, yeah, so what, what do I do with that? But, right. but so, the customers I've talked to want to get down to, okay, well, who's ready to buy? Right. You know, and right. how do I engage with those folks? I remember, you know, we, the, the stories of when, when TV came out, all the radio ex executives said, who want to watch a bunch of guys and <laughs> talking on the radio on TV? It doesn't right. make any sense. And I feel like there's the same thing here with social. It's like, well, how do I email blast? You know, all these, well you don't. There's, you got to have new processes. And it seems like customers just really haven't figured that out yet. They will, but they're, they're, they're geared toward the past and really not geared toward this new social realm. Right, well I think there's, there's two things. One is that they have to start their initiatives with a view to the action they want to take. Mm -hmm. So just saying I want to listen is meaningless. If you, if you listen for what purpose? I'm listening to improve my product management. I'm listening to improve my, tar my marketing. I'm listening for some other purpose, but you have to listen for a purpose. And that's where we see the, the initiatives that succeed versus the ones that mm. fail. Um, when they tie it into, for, for, for example, their operational system. So we've got customers that are looking at um, social sentiment, they're also looking at inventory levels, mm -hmm. right? So they've got the, the two connected. So they, then it becomes a um, more of a, an operational activity, not just a nice, oh, that's really interesting. Customers are, you know, are, are not saying positive things. But now they can say, well, look at this response over here. We need to be able to change our forecast because these products are hot, right? <laughs> and, and being able to track it that closely. And then the, um, on the social sentiment, I think the other thing uh, that's really required is that customers really need to focus on social sentiment. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> Well, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, there's something you mentioned, so uh, that we kind of heard from, yeah. we had Paul Zacopoulos on earlier today, and he mentioned something similar. You have to go into these engagements with, uh, with a business right. problem. A business problem. You know, he said the science experiment approach, not right. the way to go. Right. Um, but what's interesting about that is, uh, what we're hearing oh, in the Hadoop <laughs> world, uh, big data world, is, run, is some, some of the data scientist types are saying, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to experiment. I want to just yeah. play in this sandbox. So how do you balance those two things? How do you promote uh, kind of that kind of exploration, but at the same time, if that's all you're doing, you could quickly lead to you know, the, the backing of executive you know, leaving and, and the project going down the drains quickly. So how do you balance kind of the exploration, trying to do new things yep. with, hey, we have a business problem, let's solve that, quick win, and then move forward? Well, I think every organization should take a multifaceted approach to that do pure data research just for the sake of seeing what's out there. And I had a conversation with a client where um, she, she was really struggling with naming her project and I said, look, if, if you don't have a b defined business problem right now, then just run the data through some predictive models. Let's just look, let's do some data mining. Let's mm -hmm. just look at the data to see what patterns emerge. Because from those patterns, you might actually define a business um, a business needed or a business opportunity, right? And that, so th you want to do that, but then you want to limit how much you, <laughs> you spend on that, right. but you need to do that too. Because mm -hmm. I think there, people are going to find you know, gold in them in our heels, right? <laughs> and, and, that, and then the ones that, that are defined, make them really defined. Mm -hmm. Not just listening, make them have business outcomes, set metrics, set goals for them, just like any other project, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think too many people are not doing that. They're treating it as if it's some kind of you know, um, unaccountable thing. They're just listening and they put wordles up and they, you know, and it's all very interesting, but if it's not driving the business forward in some way, then why are we investing in it? Mm -hmm. Michelle, what's your bumper sticker on why IBM? What do you tell clients? There is just nobody that has a foundation for big data as well as an analytic platform, as well as the know-how to really guide clients on changing culture, because changing culture is as, as important mm -hmm. as having the foundation and having the analytics. So I think it's the fact that we have a holistic approach that you can bring us your biggest problem, your biggest challenge, we can address it, you can bring us something that you've already defined and we can give you the piece parts to solve it. Right? We can do the full spectrum. So. Can you do that affordably for mid-sized businesses and smaller organizations as well as the Fortune 500? 
Absolutely. On the analytics side, we have solutions today that are priced for the mid-market, they're optimized for the mid-market, meaning you don't have all the customization ability, mm -hmm. because they don't need all the customization ability. They're, they're going to configure, be configured um, for a certain amount of users, mm -hmm. for a certain scalability, and, and we, they can take those, put them in for 25 grand, get going, and as they scale and grow up uh, as an organization and they need additional capability, they can add it on. Excellent. So in terms of products, uh, I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of, uh, everyone knows IBM has acquired uh, you know, probably dozens at this point of analytic companies. You know, a I, few. I think the number was 15 <laughs> billion or something over the last. A few dozen? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few. A, a few. <laughs> so how, uh, I'm, I'm curious how you go about rationalizing all those products and, and packaging them in such a way uh, that they complement one another and actually you know, are focused on a business problem or, yeah. or an industry. Um, and I think, because I think if we're hearing from some customers or for some members of our community is, well, you know, IBM's got this wide breadth and depth of, of tools and technologies, but I, it's almost overwhelming. So I'm curious from your perspective, yep. with all these, you, you must look at, look at this portfolio and say, okay, what can we do with this? So what's your strategy? Right, so the strategy is, is two-pronged. So on the technology side, the capability side, the strategy is to um, acquire and integrate. And, and from an integration point, even in the due diligence part, we look for companies that have t a common technology platform, so the integration is not apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. it, immediately following integration we attack, uh, or acquisition, we attack what is our integration roadmap. So for example, um, IBM acquired Cognos, mm -hmm. and then acquired SPSS yep. <laughs> uh, right afterwards. SPSS was integrated within the Cognos platform from a metadata perspective within a year of acquisition, so models um, could be shared within the BI environment where metadata could be brought into the, analy the predictive analytic environment. So the strategy is to integrate on the capability side, and it, it, it doesn't happen overnight for mm -hmm. sure, and I know a lot of our clients would like it to happen <laughs> overnight, but that the roadmap is to make the, the tools work from a UI, from a capability, from a metadata perspective, seamlessly over a period of time uh, as fast as we can, basically. But the other area we're looking to integrate is from, from a functional area. Mm -hmm. Because that's where clients really don't even necessarily care about the capability. I want to solve a problem in finance. I want to solve a problem in my customer analytics area. So we've been looking at uh, those as more holistic solutions. So we've been integrating ourselves to deliver things like next best action for telco. And that is a complete solution top to bottom. Hardware, software, services. And, and we will, over time, integrate, integrate further along those horizontals as well as the uh, capabilities. Excellent. All right, Michelle, well listen, thanks very much Thank uh, for guys. coming on theCUBE. We're out of time, <laughs> we should continue, but uh, this has been a great event and really thank you for sharing your perspectives and you got a great story. And uh, check this out, well, so th this will be on demand up on YouTube. Uh, for those who don't know, siliconangle.com slash YouTube, check that out. Check, go to wikibon.org for all the research. Go to siliconangle.com for the news of the day. Keep it right here, we'll be right back after this short break. This is live from IBM IOD in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE. Great.